So with that, I'll introduce my, the first speaker of tonight, which is Dr. Josh Gold. So I'll read the, I the bio. Okay. So Dr. Josh Gold is a professor in the Department of Neuroscience, co-director of the Computational Neuroscience Initiative, and chair of the Neuroscience Graduate Group at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his PhD in neuroscience from Stanford University, where he studied experience-dependent plasticity in the barn owl, owl sound localization system in the laboratory of Dr. Eric Knudsen. He then completed his postdoctoral work at the University of Washington in the lab of Dr. Mike Shadlin, studying the neural mechanisms of decision making. At Penn, his lab continues to study the neural basis of decision making with a focus on understanding how the brain learns past, to use past experiences to optimize decisions in order to achieve specific goals. Using quantitative measures of behavior, electrophysiology, and computational modeling, Dr. Gold's research aims to provide new insights into the neural mechanisms that produce complex learned behaviors with the ultimate goal of better understanding and treating disorders of learning and cognition. Oh, there you go. Is that yours? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll start there. <laughs> Actually, that's a good place to start. Thank you, Alice. That was a... Uh, that was an absolutely fantastic introduction. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I just want to start by emphasizing how incredible I think that these events are and that it's the students that deserve 100% of the credit. They uh, conceptualized this and organized it starting a couple of years ago. And from the very beginning, it was as if it was a, a, a mature uh, organization uh, and it's been run incredibly well. Uh, so thank you again for the uh, invitation. Uh, and uh, the other thing I want to start by saying is that I promise I will explain what Banbarismus means in just a second. Um, so uh, it's easy to recognize that this is a, a small uh, set of stairs, right? Um, even when we schematize the picture a little bit more, uh, it's, it's fairly easy to recognize it for, for the object that it is. Uh, these examples might give you the impression that perception is both unambiguous and instantaneous. However, in fact, it is neither of those two things. Your brain is constantly collecting new information and using that new information in a nuanced and sophisticated way to reinterpret uh, the evidence that it gets and recognize that what might have uh, appeared to be one thing at first is in fact something else entirely. And uh, maybe uh, it, it's a little hard to, to tell on this picture, but this is actually, whoops, this is actually just a drawing on the wall. Um, so, here, I'll show you if, if that went a little fast. Uh, you have to look at it for a second. It, it's actually just a drawing that, that you can, it's not, an, it's not an actual set of stairs. This is uh, some graffiti that someone uh, uh, painted on the, the floor and the wall of a, a subway station in New York. Um, from this example, I, I just want to make the point that the process of perception, as Alice so nicely introduced, um, is a computational process that requires uh, both time and nuance uh, in order to uh, create the percepts that we have of the world. And in fact, it turns out that a, a good definition of perception involves the same basic processes that one finds across the spectrum of decision making. And by that I mean that you have to weigh ambiguous evidence, you often have to accumulate that evidence over time and over different sources, and ultimately take that accumulated evidence and commit to a final judgment. Now, thinking about the, the, the perceptual process in this way has turned out to have many advantages, uh, some of which that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, a main one is that it allows us to bring studies of decision making into a laboratory setting where we can carefully control the inputs and outputs of the system and understand what the underlying brain mechanisms are. The other interesting uh, sort of uh, side note to this is that this very process is something uh, that uh, has some very interesting sort of historical uh, anecdotes involved with them that turn out to provide a very, very precise quantitative framework uh, by which uh, my work and many others have used to study uh, how these processes act in the brain. And so I'm going to use that framework today to talk about it. Uh, and that framework is, in fact, uh, the, the reference in the title to Banbarismus. And so uh, the history now goes back to World War II, where Alan Turing, a famous and tragic mathematician, worked with his colleagues at a place called Bletchley Park uh, 
in England to try to decode messages that were intercepted from, uh, from the Germans, typically from, uh, from, the, uh, from their navy, but also from, from the other forces. Uh, it turns out that this, uh, this code-breaking group used pieces of paper that were printed in the town of Banbury. And so they referred to their process as Banburismus. And I'll explain in just a little bit what that process was. So here's the problem that they set out to solve. This is something called the Enigma machine. It looks like a typewriter. It's actually a fairly sophisticated uh, encryption device. And the idea is that a message that would be something like attack at dawn, but in, you know, in German, obviously, would be typed into the machine, but the output of the machine is not the sequence of letters that were put in, but rather a garbled sequence of letters. And it wasn't just a simple encryption where each letter was matched to a separate letter, but in fact, the mapping from input to output changed every time you entered a letter. And that's what made it very difficult to decode. And in fact, if the machine was used correctly, it would have been, in principle, impossible to decode. But it turns out that it was not used correctly by the Germans, which allowed uh, Alan Turing and his colleagues to exploit very, very uh, small and slightly ambiguous pieces of evidence to make decisions about what were the contents of the message that, that they, uh, that they uh, were able to capture. And that's the process that I'm going to talk about. And so the idea is that you would enter a message, you'd get this garbled stream. That garbled stream would be transmitted openly because the Germans thought that it was, that it was unbreakable. At the receiving end, you would essentially reverse the polarity of the Enigma machine. You'd type in the garbled messages, and out would come the correct message. Right? OK. There was a lot, of, a, a lot of details involved with the decryption scheme that Turing and his colleagues came up with. I'm going to talk about one piece that has very direct relationship to decision making. And it involved uh, making a decision, a very simple decision, between two competing hypotheses. And that is, for any given pair of messages that they picked out in a given day, it turned out to be very important to them if they could figure out if those two messages happened to come from two machines that were in the same state, meaning they were making the same translation of input to output, versus machines in different states. And I'm happy to explain later sort of why that was important. But for now, I'll just assume that that was important. And so this is the decision that they had to make. And so here we're going to go through the process of weighing, accumulating, and committing. I'm going to use the Banbarismus process to explain the principles and in each case, show you how those principles actually map directly into how the brain appears to solve even the simplest perceptual decision-making problems. Okay? And so here, the first step, which is kind of the, the most tricky, and so hopefully I can make, through the, uh, make it through this clearly, is the idea of weighing evidence. And I want to describe exactly what I mean by weighing evidence. What is evidence, and how do you weigh it? Okay? So here, we can have a very precise definition of evidence with respect to these hypotheses. Let's consider first the second hypothesis, that the two machines are not in the same state. What that means is that essentially the relationship between the characters in the first uh, message are completely unrelated to the characters in the second message. And therefore, the probability that you would have uh, achieved a, uh, I'm just trying to figure out the laser pointer on this thing. I think I, no, it's not, so. All right, let me try one more, oh, there we go, okay. Um, so imagine you get a matched pair of characters here. In that case, the probability under this hypothesis is just 1 in 26, right? So if you have one letter here, the chance that the other one is going to be the same one, it's just, one, it's just whether you get that 1 out of the 26 possible letters, okay? Which implies that the probability of getting a non-match is just the complement to that, which is 25 out of 26 times, okay? What Turing and colleague realized is that if machines were in the same state, these numbers are different. Okay? And these numbers aren't whether the, the match is from a uniform distribution of these characters, but rather it's just the probability that you would get matching letters normally in the German language. And that's not 1 in 26 because some letters are more common than others. Right? So the letter S shows up a lot more than the letter Q. And so it turns out the letters are not uniformly distributed, and so the probabilities are not the same. And again, I can go through the details later, but it turns out that the probability of getting a match given the German language is about 1 in 13. Right? 
So even if you don't know what the underlying message is, if you know that this character is translated in the same way as this character, then if these two characters match, then the underlying character must match as well, right? And in that case, it's the 1 and 13, and the complement of that is the 12 and 13, right? So now we can do a little bit of math, and what they realized is that if you rearrange these terms a little bit, you get something that what they refer to as the weight of evidence, okay? So let me take you through what that means. So in that case, we can consider the weight of evidence that supports hypothesis one versus hypothesis two, given that you found a match, right? And all that is just a fancy way of saying we're going to compare this probability to this probability, okay? And so we just take the ratio of those two probabilities. We can do the same thing for the weight of evidence of one versus two, given a non-match. So what this means is we're now ascribing precise numbers to the weight of evidence associated with every time we find a matching pair of characters and every time we find a non-matching pair of characters, right? So they did another little bit of fancy math. I'll explain a little bit why they did this. It'll make more sense then, but they took something called the logarithm of this, which is just a transformation of these numbers. One of the reasons why this is useful is that it allows you to interpret just the sign of this number in a really useful way. And for those of, and, and this is sort of an interesting side note, the base of the logarithm matters here. And you might have heard of the units that are used if you use the base two of a logarithm of two probabilities like this, that is the definition of a bit. So when you talk about a bit in a computer, that's what it is, okay? And so this is a way of defining the amount of information associated with a match or a non-match. Turns out they didn't use a base 2, they used a base e, and this is just another way where they could show their cleverness of using words that were associated with the town of Banbury, uh, where they did all these computations. And so you might see in the literature sometime a unit called bands, that's where it comes from. The interesting thing, as I said, is thinking about now just the sign of these units, which have a very intuitive explanation. A positive number means that you're giving more support for hypothesis 1 than hypothesis 2. A negative number means more support for 2 versus 1. What this means is, for any given matched pair, it makes you think it's more likely that they were in the same state, and any given unmatched pair thinks you're more likely in the other state. So we have a very precise definition of the weight of evidence. Okay? So we can now translate this, and, and they were aware that this was a very general process. As I.J. Good, one of the mathematicians said, a deciband or half deciband, that's a tenth of a band, is about the smallest change in weight of evidence that is directly perceptible to human intuition. I feel that it is an important aid to human reasoning and will eventually improve the judgments of doctors, lawyers, and other citizens. They were really aware of the power of this formalism. So here, uh, now to, to quickly interlude to the brain. So what does this have to do with the brain? Consider the kind of task that Alice already introduced. You have to decide the direction of motion of a stimulus. This isn't the waves that she showed, but it's the same idea. This is what we call a random dot stimulus, which for various reasons is a very common stimulus used in uh, the kinds of tasks that, that we and others perform. Here, the decision is between a hypothesis that the motion is rightward versus the motion is leftward. Hopefully, most of you can see that this is moving leftward. So, as Alice showed you, we as neuroscientists study different parts of the brain. It turns out there's a part of the brain in the, uh, that's here, sort of sitting right behind your ear, that has these very, very interesting properties. And I just want to show you a very, very uh, sort of high-level uh, representation of those, that if you consider a particular neuron and map the number of electrical impulses or action potentials, as Alice described them, um, uh, under the condition where you're actually showing rightward versus leftward motion, you tend to find neurons that respond differently under those cases. So here's a neuron that responds more to leftward motion versus rightward motion. In fact, this is a very idealized description. These neurons don't tend to give a single kind of response, but they give a distribution of responses. And so when you get leftward motion, you tend to get some responses at this value, some a little higher, some a little lower and this other neuron similarly, but for a low value, okay? And this is what we would call a leftward sensitive neuron. There are similarly rightward sensitive neurons that have the opposite kinds of responses. And so they tend to give more impulses per second for rightward responses than for leftward responses. Now, there's a reason I kind of went through the rigmarole of showing these funny shapes and distributions here, because it turns out that if, again, you do a little bit of math, 
and you take these two neurons, and this one is firing at some number of impulses per second, and this is firing at some other impulses per second, and you just take the difference between those two values, right, which is what's plotted here, it turns out that is directly related to the weight of evidence in units of bands, as was described by Alan Turing. So in other words, you can directly read out from the number of impulses that a pair of neurons in the brain are giving the exact form of the weight of evidence that's required to make optimal decisions. Okay? Okay. So uh, move quickly. So now to explain why we used logarithms, as a mathematician C. Pierce said, two arguments that are entirely independent, neither weakening nor strengthening each other, ought when they concur to produce a belief equal to the sum of the intensities of belief, which either would produce separately. It's a fancy way of saying, if you have one piece of evidence and another piece of evidence, how do you combine them? You should be able to just add them. And that's what logarithms do. By taking the logarithm of the likelihood ratio, every time you get a new piece of evidence, you just add it together. Which means that as you interpret this whole sequence of letters here, it's a process of simply adding up the weight of evidence for each non-match and each match over time. Right? And so the underlying decision process becomes the accumulated weight of evidence. Right? And it's this process of accumulating the weight of evidence that was actually the process that was done by these Banbarismus papers with the holes in them. They sort of slid the holes across each other and then allowed them to count the matches very quickly. Um, in the brain, we can think about the weight of evidence provided by those neurons before now as just values corresponding to strong rightward evidence, weak rightward evidence, weak leftward evidence, uh, or uh, strong leftward evidence that is coming in over time. The simplest um, now model of this accumulation process, if you have constant evidence coming in and you're adding up each piece of evidence, then you should change these straight lines going across into ramps going up and down. This is just, this is just translating a constant input into the accumulation of that constant. Right? So you start at zero, and the longer it comes on, the bigger this goes up. And the implication of this is that the thing in the brain that is accumulating evidence should look like ramping activity going up and down. Right? And here is the neuroscience part of this. When we record from certain areas of the brain, this is exactly what we see. So this is a slightly cartoon representation, but this is real data from a brain of a monkey doing a decision task where we are varying the strength of evidence coming in. And this is our best evidence so far that the, the, the process of accumulating evidence is actually represented in the brain. OK, the last little bit, and I'll be done in, in just a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm over time already, uh, is the idea of committing to the decision. This is the part where understanding the pressures that Turing and his colleagues were under really uh, gives intuition for why this is important. So, the, the process that they decided upon, um, so to speak, for committing to the decision was to defining beforehand how much evidence you wanted to accumulate before committing, right? Meaning, as you accumulate, if you get to this level, then just stop. And that would imply that this hypothesis is true. Or if you get to this point, then you should stop. And so in the process we showed before, you'd accumulate until you reach here, and you'd say, I now have enough evidence that machines are in this state. The interesting implication for this is it shows you that decision processes are not automatic and, in fact, involve a great deal of subjective um, sort of strategy. And what I mean by that is clear when you think about how it is that you set this bound. It balances an inherent trade-off between the speed and the accuracy of the decision process. If you set the bound very low, it means you can reach it very quickly, but you haven't accumulated very much evidence. If you set it high, you can accumulate a lot of evidence to be accurate, but it can take you too much time. Now, obviously, in the, in the course of, of decoding in war, they needed both speed and accuracy. And so the idea that the decision process itself was about understanding what your goals were in terms of how you would interpret this evidence is a fundamental part of how we're trying to understand the brain, uh, how this process works in the brain. That it's not a simply reflexive automatic process, but involves strategizing about what your goals are. And for that, the last little bit, uh, this is just sort of a, um, a description of now the future work. I didn't tell you where in the brain this activity was found. 
It turns out that it's found in a part of the brain that Alice showed you before, deep inside the brain called the basal ganglia. It turns out that that part of the brain is a primary target of deep brain stimulation electrodes to help Parkinson's disease. And so right now, some colleagues and I are beginning a study that involves recording from neural activity in the brains of Parkinson's patients while they're doing these decisions tasks to understand if and how this particular part of the brain contributes to this much more sort of high level strategic part of even the simplest perceptual decisions, which will hopefully give us some insights into the kinds of deficits that can occur in Parkinson's and other diseases with cognition, perception, and decision making. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Time for two, two questions, two minutes. That was all crystal clear, I guess. <laughs> all right, I guess we'll set up for Michael. Oh. When you're saying the, um, the process of decision making by practicing, like what psychologists try to do, like this is a question for me, and I will. I think to me it seems not, <laughs> but when it's formed, it's formed. And I, I also have heard that um, the all the evidences around you cause you to have a kind of speed in decision making and and then make the correct decisions. So uh -huh. that's what the, what the psychologists say, uh -huh. and they they claim that it's it can be improved by practicing, but when, like, I doubt it, so. <laughs> uh-huh, um, well, let me, let me leave your doubts a little bit. <laughs> uh, I was smiling because that question is the exact question that I built my lab on, um, which is, it, how is it that, ex that you can learn to improve exactly these kinds of decisions? And, you know, what you're asking is a very broad question, and certainly there are some kinds of decisions that you can probably get better at, and, and some not. But even the simplest decisions, even these, what you would maybe uh, intuitively think of as these very low-level perceptual decisions. It's just, you're just telling me whether you see visual motion or not. Um, you can get much better at it with training. Um, one of the, one of the, that's very well known. One of the, the really interesting nuances of that question that, that isn't really well understood is how well does it generalize? So if, if I had you look at that dot stimulus over and over and over, day after day, you would get much better at seeing motion in that stimulus. But it's not at all clear that that would generalize to any other stimulus. Not only might it not generalize to another stimulus, but sometimes it might not even generalize if I just move the stimulus in your visual field. The learning that you do on these things are very, very specific. And it's not really well understood why your brain is wired that way, to become better at very, very specific things and not generalize better. Are there uh, compute realistic computer simulations of this process? And if so, how do they work on other problems outside the brain, you know, for whatever purpose, or AI problems? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's another really good question. So certainly, one of the advantages of the approach that I talked about is that we can build a computer model that does exactly that process, right? And, and <laughs> you know, uh, Turing is, the, is one of the founders of modern computing, like those very ideas sort of started there, that, that once you define these algorithms, you can implement them not only in the brain, but in software and in hardware, and they can do, uh, they can do some things. Then there's the more interesting part of the question that you're really asking, which is, can you get them to do things that are anything close to what we do? Uh, and there, I would argue the answer is no, um, at least not yet. Um, you know, certainly the kinds of algorithms that we're talking about here are remarkably simple. And, and, you know, that uh, we could change the, the, the rules of the task uh, in lots of ways that a human subject would be very robust to. And, the, you know, a, a, an algorithm, a, a computer simulation of that algorithm would be a disaster at, right? It does, it does its one thing. You give it its output uh, and, and uh, you give it its input and it, and it gives the output. So those are the kinds of questions that we're working on. Um, as a, you know, as an example of that, um, you know, if you just, if you simply, uh, as I was talking about 
um, before. You know, if you do something as simple as move the stimulus out of the input stage of the model, then the model doesn't know what to do. These are the kinds of things that we're very robust to. You just turn your head and you look at it. Um, but those are, those are things that, that, we're, that are definitely being actively worked on. Okay. Do we have time for one more? Uh-huh. Yeah. What about uh, the kind of high level part of the brain that, that interprets that? Is there a way to you know, shut that off if you will, and maybe have the direct output of those very primitive uh, neurons versus trying to overthink it? Yeah, yeah. So so that's a good question. The um the, the neural data that I showed at the end is from that higher level area that's reading those out. And so we have some insights into those. Um, one of the reasons that we, um, that we uh, have an understanding of those rightward and leftward neurons is some of the earliest experiments looked directly at how you could measure and manipulate those bypassing the higher centers and show that they can have a direct effect on perception. And so you can go in and some of the earliest experiments uh, electrically um, sort of... Uh, uh, um, uh, affected the activity of those cells, and you could actually change perception that way. And exactly how that interacts with the rest of the brain dealing with the fact that you've got this abnormal set of activity going on there is another thing that we don't really understand. But we know that, that in each of the components, it can have a measurable effect on perception and behavior. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.